the 1500s, when it had finally been realized that this whole gunpowder fad had actually come to stay, new defensive developments was begun in order to combat the breaching of the previous straight castle stone walls by cannonballs. Developments in metallurgy at the time had made cannons cheaper and thus more numerous on the battlefield and they represented a clear danger in siege warfare. So new castle fortifications, ramparts had to be built especially in order to better withstand the onslaught of cannonball and shot. Now this led to the development of one of the most beautiful defensive structures ever built, the Star Fort. Originally designed in Italy, the concept soon spread throughout Europe and although complicated and expensive sometimes to build, they would make sieges much more costly for the attacking enemy. Star forts were very different in their layout and construction than the regular straight stonewalled castles. Now I'll visit two of them because I want to show you exactly what I'm talking about. And at first glance, these two castles or forts are completely different in design and layout. Even the reasoning for their construction is not the same. We're visiting the Danish royal castle of Cornwall and the Dutch fortified fortress town of Boutange. Let me first for my American friends however clarify that the Dutch and the Danes are not the same people. The Dutch live in Holland, sometimes referred to as the Netherlands, and the Danes live in Denmark. They're Danish and they are actually separated by quite some distance as well. Although in the 1500s they were actually allies and they were both warring seagoing nations with quite a lot of experience in the battle of sieges. After the use of cannon and gunpowder had really taken a hold, the nature of sieges too had to change. Now strongholds, fortresses and castles had to be built in a manner that could not easily be disassembled by the use of cannonball. The star fort was one of the best ways of achieving this. Now several components were amongst key in constructing and defending a 16th century star fort. Number one, you needed a brilliant military engineer, that was certainly on top of that list, and you needed a lot of supplies and gunpowder stored. But regardless of what type of fortress you chose to build, the most important part was still its location. Where you choose to place your fortress is of key importance, and both of the forts we're visiting today were placed in a strategic place for strategic reasons both where they could utilize the waterways for defense. And certainly the Danes are a seafaring nation and they know a thing or two about water, just like the Dutch. They placed the Kornball where they needed it to levy taxes. And the Dutch, experts in redirection of waterways, being a low-lying country, they placed the fortress of Portage to make full use of the waterways and wetlands for defense. And, just like Kornbor, they placed it right on a trade route between Germany and Spanish-held part of Holland. Of course, you also want your fortress at somewhat elevated precision, or at least in one clear of natural obstacles. So at times, forests and stray buildings were cut down so the men of the fort could observe all the approaches with an unobstructed view. And from time to time, it was not unusual for buildings or even parts of cities laying outside the fortress walls to be burnt down by the defender as the siege was about to begin in order to deny these to the attacker. The key component of a star fort was the bastions. Each bastion had two sides that would hold the artillery pieces and could target the enemy at a great distance as they were at an elevated position. The bastions were connected by curtain walls. These could be protected from the bastion's shoulders. Now the curtain walls were usually what was attacked by enemy artillery as they presented a flat, straight surface to shoot at. So to protect these, revelines were constructed in front of them, both to split up an attacking enemy force as well as to protect the curtain walls from direct fire. And sometimes these were part of the outer works, crown works, as in here in Holland, the ravelines themselves are surrounded by water and fortified by cannon, making it even harder for an attacker 
to near the actual fortress walls. These were protected by a glacis, earth walls, facing the enemy. And should the enemy be able to breach even these, they were within clear view and shot of cannon and musket from the city walls themselves. The low and sloping outer walls of the Star Fortress might be called the glacis. They were extremely thick and low to better withstand the prolonged bombardment of artillery, just like the bastions, however lower. Sometimes there would be a small berm in front of the walls that could be manned by soldiers with muskets, archbuses, crossbows, or small hand cannons. In front of these could easily be a ditch filled with water, creating further obstacles, and in front of that, the glasses protecting a path from where more soldiers could be placed. After the 1600s and lessons had been learned, it became more normal with further outworks and more earth ramparts to be built on the other side of the moat or the ditch to further protect the soldiers fighting from here and make it even harder for the enemy cannons to fire directly onto the fortress walls. With more outworks, or glasses or crown works, moats, giving the enemy even more obstacles to cross before getting to the actual city wall and all the while trying to fight its way through the various outer defenses, the enemy would be under constant fire from the city walls as well as the defenders on the various breastworks outside the walls. Of course, the better a star fortress had been built, the longer a siege might last, and it thus became more and more important to stock enough supplies to feed the population and continue the fight and thus withstand the siege and not having to fall through losses within. Or, of course, not fall from the occasional ruses that was perpetrated every now and again and caused the loss of quite a few castles throughout history. In 1658, the Swedes arrived at the gates of Copenhagen. The Danish defenses of the city was initially in a poor state. However, the population rallied, and soon the walls and moats were improved. Cannons from ships that were anchored were brought into the city's defenses, which now contained over 50 tons of lead, 4,000 muskets, and over 500 miles of slow match. Of course, food, water, and grain also had been stored, and in order to deny the Swedish attackers any shelter, the Danish king burnt down all the houses outside the city walls which had previously been occupied by almost a third of the city's inhabitants. Still, the population rallied behind him. Both volunteers, women and soldiers, joined in the fight for the city. This did quite a lot for equality in Denmark in the years after. At the time, Denmark was allied with the Dutch, and a Dutch fleet breached the Swedish defenses and surrounding ring, broke in and alleviated the Danes and joined in the fight. But just like the defenders of a siege needs to either have reinforcements come from outside or be incredibly well stocked, the besieging army needs to be fully supplied. And they could of course receive supplies and reinforcements as they were on the outside of the siege ring. But just like in the 19th century, where it's estimated that takes 1 to 10, of artillery to defend that of which it takes to occupy. Thus, a smaller force could easily defend against a far larger one. They would need fewer provisions. However, the larger force attacking would need far more, and usually they were laying sieges quite some distance from their home territory as well. It all took a lot of logistics and planning to conduct a siege or defend from within them and of course paramount, the stock of gunpowder. It was estimated by Dutch historians that at the siege of Ostende, 2,000 pounds of gunpowder was expended every day. Kornborg translates to Crown Castle. It was built in the early 1400s by the Danish King Erik of Pomerania. One of the reasons for its location here was it was the narrowest place of the sound between Denmark and Sweden, and it put the castle in a prime location to control and demand taxes from the ships crossing the straits. At the time of its construction, the Kingdom of Denmark extended to both sides of this strait. 
Now initially, the castle was not as large or elaborate as we see it today. It was a smaller two-story stone building that consisted of four square curtain walls. The buildings on the northeastern corner was where the king had his residence and the southwest was a large banquet hall, which eventually grew to being the largest in Europe at the time. King Christian III had the corners of the curtain wall supplemented with bastions in 1558. However, due to the now improved striking range of artillery, it had become clear here, as well as many other places, that it was necessary to modernize the fortress. And after the Northern Seven Year War in 1570, King Frederick II began the extension of the advanced bastions. And from 1578, the initial two-story buildings was enlarged and heightened, and the gigantic ballroom had now been constructed over the chapel and the elaborate sculptural work was designed and coordinated by Gert van Groening, who by the sound of it also came from Holland. The King's and Queen's corridor was also enlarged at this time and the exterior walls were clad with sandstone. And also this new castle was given the largest copper roof seen at the time. However, a great fire wrecked the castle and yet today most people mistakenly believe this was a consequence of one of the Danish-Swedish wars. However, this was not so. The Great Fire was in 1629 and merely a result of two careless workmen. The fire had however gutted the castle except for the chapel. King Christian decided to restore the castle in its original look and shape and by 1639 the exterior had been reconstituted to match that from before the fire. However, the interior was never fully restored to its former glory, and quite a few modernizations were made, including those for firefighting. Also, portals, chimneys, ceiling paintings, and other decorations were renewed in a more Baroque design. During one of the many many Danish-Swedish wars, this one in 1658, and during the time of the siege of Copenhagen, where the town was surrounded by Swedish forces, who had also occupied a large part of Denmark, and now the town of Helsingør, which surrounds the castle on the land side. They had waged a ferocious battle for both for Copenhagen and for the castle in Helsingør. With its 77 cannons, the entire city of Copenhagen at the time had just over 300 cannons defending. King Frederick III had appointed Colonel Paul Bierfeldt commander of the royal castle and ordered him to defend it at all cost. And should he fail, Kornborg was to be blown up to prevent the Swedes from getting it. As the Swedes took shelter in the city of Helsingør outside the castle, they were bombarded from the castle as the Danes attempted to set the city on fire, denying it to the Swedish soldiers, who, of course, in return, bombarded the castle. However, the Swedish forces managed to advance and take the first outer line of defenses, and by the use of a ruse, remember I warned you about these, they claimed that Copenhagen had fallen, and the Swedish soldiers started the full celebration, and the colonel, in doubt, surrendered the castle intact. Now, Kornborg remained in Swedish hands until the peace treaty was finally signed two years later, and the Swedish king's sister even lived there. But as a result of Swedish occupation, the castle was further deprived of many of its precious artworks, paintings, and even the fountain. Of course, the conquest of Kornborg Castle had proven that it was far from impregnable and the defenses were strengthened further from 1688. Another advanced line of defenses of crown works were added and a series of ramparts were built around it. After this additional fortification, the castle was considered the strongest fortress in Europe, occupied by the military as the king had by then moved out, and from 1739 it was used to keep people in as a prison. The inmates were guarded by the soldiers billeted in the castle and the convicts here were sentenced to work on the castle's fortifications. They were divided into two categories, those with minor sentences that could be categorized as honest criminals, were allowed to work outside the castle walls, 
while those serving sentences for violence, murder, and arson, and the likes, were categorized dishonest and had to serve their full sentence during hard labor inside the castle ramparts. Between 1785 and 1922, the castle was completely under military administration, and after a period of a number of renovations had taken place, it was open to the public in 1938 and remains so as a museum today. Over the many centuries, the castles that have been built have been some of the most spectacular fortifications and structures built by man. They are inherently beautiful and dominant. There are signs of strength and wealth of the kingdom that built and constructed it. They're also a sign of defense and protection with its thick, large, dominant walls. Here at Cornwall, you can still see the holes made by the Swedish cannons. Approaching this castle, I cannot help but think to myself, how on earth did the Swedes get past the ravelines, get over the moats, the many, several moats, how did they breach the first layer of defenses? They breached the outer layer of crown works, they covered the moat, and obviously they did it all under fire from the Danish cannons. But it's interesting to note about Hornbor, they built the main defense towards inland. They were not worried as much about a seaborne invasion, Obviously, amphibious invasions and landings was not a thing of the time, and they expected a siege from within, from the town of Helsinger, exactly as the Swedes did, and it was in this direction the Danish castle was prepared to make its main defensive stand. And being a royal castle, this is the first you see, so obviously, the entry gate has to be elaborately decorated. Everything is about making an impression, also on one's enemies, because before they make it through this bridge and try to get through the gate with the heavy doors, they have to make it over the first crown works, the ravelin and the cannons, past the bridge house. Eventually, they'll make it through, and inside you have a small village that literally lives between the outer walls and the inner walls of the actual castle. This is where the military garrison would eventually be housed. Also, you would have blacksmiths, you would have powder magazines. All the day-to-day -day needs and doings of a small village would literally live here between the two walls. They were protected, but not quite protected as much as the king inside. And I will say, standing here below the castle, in front of the curtain walls, or here at the bastions, it is very imposing and very impressive. And having the bastions clad with red brick is for a good reason. They will withstand the impact of cannonball better. Stone would shatter, brick would not. They would merely break. And of course, behind the brick, there are several meters of packed dirt for additional protection. And of course, the bastions, being as tall as they were, could easily have cannons placed that would shoot out over both the glasses and the ravelines out in front of them. And obviously placed outside the walls of the royal abode is the main powder magazine. It is, however, a little harder to discern what changes took place in the hundreds of years the military used this as a prison. Another interesting aspect of the constantly evolving construction and design and redesign of the defenses of Cornwall is that you have no straight road leading from the outside into the actual castle itself. There's walls surrounded by walls where you have to make many turns, obviously under fire and observation, to get both through to, to the main entrance or through the walls with everything from deliveries to try to make attacks. It truly had must made an impression on any visitor to the royal castle to come through all these elaborate defenses, these large walls, 
and of course all the elaborate design that goes along with it. It's very imposing and it's very intricate. So even if you try to sneak in and try to map your way out on how to plan an attack, it wasn't that straightforward. And as you enter the castle, if you look carefully, you can see some of the many years of design changes. Here you see one of the little lion's head. This must have been an outer wall facing outwards, where this had been clearly not covered up by the recent change on addition. And it's striking when you view Kronborg from above, you see how the latter crown works pointing inwards, but the seaside appears less protected by large walls. It would however be very hard for ship cannons at the time to elevate in any which way to hit the actual castle walls. However, for the defenders on the high walls to hit ships passing by would be a relatively easy task. The Danish royal court was a very mobile one. They would constantly travel from castle to castle and bring all their correspondence, servants, wardrobes, documents with them. It would take over 150 carriages to transport everything, not including their army of servants. Sometimes they would only stay at a castle for a few days where everything had to be unpacked and prepared for the royal king's arrival. Matter of hours, everything would be ready, and yet he might only stay for a day or two where they could pack everything up and leave again. Here at the Chancellery, the king would rule the kingdom alongside of his most senior of noblemen. From here all his letters and decrees was dispatched, and when he had responded to letters and they had been penned using quill and ink, they were bound and sewn into a pouch. These correspondences were then stored in a large chest that would always accompany the king whenever he moved on to the next castle. King Frederick II could take full view of his kingdom on the other side of the sound through the window here when not spending his time in the king's chamber entertaining his friends and guests after hunting parties. This was, in many ways, one of the most important rooms in the castle. The royal apartment was where the king, in residence, would meet with the noblemen and make some of the most important decisions of state. Back then, the king and queen would sleep in separate bedrooms, and in case of an arranged marriage that was an unhappy union, that was a good thing. However, it was also a sign of status. They could sleep in small independent bedrooms that they could afford to heap up with fireplaces. Poorer people would either sleep together for warmth or entire families would sit up sleeping in the bed. At the great ballroom, they would serve up to 24 dishes for a large amount of guests. And interestingly enough, when there was no party here, it would be used for storage of everything from vegetables, fruits, tables, and even building materials would be stored here in this amazing place when there was not a party. Now you have to admit, if this was your life, if this was your every day keeping court here in this beautiful room, in this beautiful palace, you would want to protect it with moats and guns and cannons and heavy doors. That is exactly what they did. The castle has been upgraded a number of times over the years, ever since the initial construction, just for safety, because honestly, if I lived here, every gun in the kingdom would be surrounding it to keep me safe. Well, keep the palace safe. And the queen, of course. If you have a castle, it comes with the queen, right? That's given.
As it is with all castles, the lower you go, the older the parts become. As many castles were built on existing structures, the first one here dating back to the 1200s, The great Danish folk hero of Holger Denske comes from a lot of different sagas in which he, amongst others, did battle constantly with Charlemagne. However, he has become the symbol of Danish patriotism, especially during the Second World War. Who he really was, we may never really know, but the saga and the symbol still stands, or sits in the basement of Kornborg, awaiting the rescue of us all. As we go on down further into the castle bowels, we actually are not underground. We are still on level. We are somewhere within the bastions or the curtain walls. Here you would have everything from dungeons to defensive positions with cannons protruding from the walls in different directions. Also, many of these places would be used for storage. Since, as I said, to survive a siege, you would have to have your granaries full and powder everywhere you could possibly stick it. And having a lot of storage is probably a good thing. Because, as I said, this castle is built in order to control and levy taxes of the trade sailing through the sound here. And the king's men would board the ships ask the skipper for the value of his cargo. The skipper would be sort of in a bind because that also came with the king's men had first dibs on the cargo for whatever the price the skipper then quoted them. So if he quoted them too low in order to avoid paying high toll or taxes, the king's men might buy it from him. However, if he quoted them too high, he would have to pay a higher taxes. It kept the trade honest, but also it gave the king first dibs on anything on the ships sailing past his castle, so constantly he could keep his granaries and storages full of whatever he might need. <laughs> People really were shorter back then, so we're just going to duck. It's very interesting to note that the Dutch fortress of Boutange was constructed much for the same purpose as the Danish fort, in order to control the only road between Germany and the city of Groningen, which was at that time controlled by the Spaniards after the 80-year war. So controlling the trade route, and of course its own military protection, it was completed in 1593, in a similar time frame as the castle in Denmark. It continued to serve as a defensive network on the German border until 1851. Yet this was a very much different design than that of the fancy Danish royal castle. It was very much a star fort, and a beautiful one at that, but with low earth walls and brick. Earth, as it would absorb cannon shot. And through an elaborate network of canals and lakes used as moats, utilizing the waterways excellently for its defense, as well as the surrounding wetlands. It survived several sieges and was never forced to surrender. Boutange never had a large, elaborate castle placed in the center of it. However, the small village was where people at the time lived and still live today. The construction and layout made it possible for it to be defended by a very small garrison, and in the time of crisis and war, 
the surrounding villagers would pull into the castle, into the fortress, shut the doors and the gates, and take to the walls for defense. From above, it is one of the most beautiful and symmetrical man-made constructions I've ever seen. One could only have wished for those who designed it to be able to see it from above, although judging from its drawings, they had some idea. Extensive crown works were added to it facing the German side from where attackers were most likely to come. At the start of the Eighty Year War, 1568-1648, the Spaniards took control of the city of Groningen and the passage to Germany through a wet marshy area. William, the instigator of the Dutch Revolt, deemed it necessary to seize control of this link between Groningen and Germany, and he decided to have the fortification built in the Boutage Passage. Soon after its construction complete, Spanish forces from Groningen besieged it, yet the attack ended in failure. Boutage faced another siege in 1672 against the invading forces of Prince Bishop of Münster, and after capturing 18 cities and towns in the northern Netherlands before, they now demanded the fort to be surrendered. The fort's governor, Captain Ports, refused and the Munsters replied with a frontal attack, which failed spectacularly. Thanks to the surrounding marshes and the time-tested fortification, this invading army was also repelled successfully. That is a water obstacle that will take time, especially in the 1500s, 1600s when this was built and saw battle. You imagine the uniforms and the wool and the heavy muskets and the powder in the powder bags that have to climb over or swim over this water obstacle while under fire from the fort. Not something anybody would really want to do, not even today. And on the outcroppings of the star, there would be battlements and cannon positions, just like right here, firing in every direction that's where there's so many corners, so you can fire in every direction. With the moat on one side, and observation towers, and you have cannons in there, this in itself was a defensive position, where you'd had cannons and men on this side, and then another moat on the outside, ringing the outer defenses, and a lot of flatlands for the enemy to traverse to get to it. So, I just want to drive into this phenomenal fortress. Just because I want to show you the path an enemy would have to take. If they got past the long range cannons, then they would get to the first moat here. So, if they made it over this moat, and past the little puppy dogs, then they couldn't get straight into the fort here. They would have to come all the way down this long road, being flanked by fire from the right. And then, of course, would be another turn. Then you'd have to traverse all of this road, have to travel under fire from up here to get to the next drawbridge. That you have to overcome that under fire from here, and then finally to get to the last one in front of the city gate, if you will which there are two. On the other side of that road down there is the main drawbridge and entrance. In front of it is the little island that can defend that. This is one of the ravelines protecting the curtain walls with cannons and its own powder magazines. This was not an easy proposition. Drawbridge after drawbridge after drawbridge. You just pull up, button up, you man the walls and you're ready to defend. And even if not as large and elaborate as that of Cornwall, the principles are exactly the same. You funnel the enemy through a lot of different turns in front of your flanking fire, and you have drawbridges, and of course, you have a little bridge house. The building has been here for a long time. So this will be the final drawbridge as you walk into the actual village. And there is an actual village in here where people actually live, which just makes it 
like one of my favorite places to want to buy a place to live. And here we're meeting Hendry, the manager of Boutange. And I will say, this gate is not that much smaller than that of Cornwall. Well, it was built in 1580 uh, because uh, it was one uh, huge, uh, I don't know the, the exact word, uh, well, wet, wet area around here. And there's only one, one sandy road uh, was there. And on that sandy road, they built this fortress because the, the city of Groningen. Uh, it was in uh, Spanish hands at that uh, moment, and so if they built this fortress, uh, the, the, the city of Groningen uh, could be defended. So that's why they built it, the fortress over here. And then uh, several years later it became bigger and bigger and bigger, and around 1740 it was uh, as it looks like now. And it's now completely rebuilt to that situation, to that uh, period. And several times it was attacked, but never was it taken in by any enemy. So you are the first who took in the, 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 the fortress today. So <laughs> I think we kick you out at the end of the day. But <laughs> Well, I, I do have Prussian heritage, but the Prussians were on your side when there was a battle, weren't they? They, they were on, on our side. But so? when the, the bishop from uh, Münster came in here, he tried several times, but he also never came in. And once he offered 200,000 uh, guilders uh, to, the, to the captain of uh, the fortress, and he answered, I got 200,000 bullets for you. To come here you need boats, but they didn't bring boats here because there's no sea or anything uh, in the area. So they had to come over the water, but because we were very high and there was uh, no vegetation, you could see the enemy from far away, so we could shoot on them as soon as we saw them. What cannons were here? What, what kind of munitions you had? When you're here, when the cannons were? Well, we have the, the cannons you, you saw here, it's a 24 pounders, 18 uh, pounders. And we have also small cannons, and then we they have the, the musket uh, they have, it's uh, more the, the guns. And uh, of course, uh, they have uh, hand weapons and, and small guns also. So it's different kinds, and also uh, all with powder in it. And grape shot? Yes. Canister shot, and you could literally just pepper the everybody and the enemy would be from below yes so did they bring up cannons to fire at the fort they they, they bring up cannons and that's why it's, it's from sand if you shoot a, a bullet into sand there will be no damage if you have wood or stone there will be a lot of damage if you shoot it some small battles were there and there were also battles in the environment because when they couldn't come into the fortress they went over to other places but then soldiers from the fortress went outside and for, uh, to, to fight and they always won they never lost a battle here how big was the garrison in the 1700s? Uh, it depends. Uh, sometimes 50, 60 uh, people. But when there was, uh, was an enemy coming up, there were more than 1,000 people uh, living here. So there were soldiers coming out from Groningen, from Winshout, and from all places around here. And they were then in, in the fortress. So all the villages. So there was a village here that, that existed. There was a village that existed. That there were people living here, working here, uh, eating, making their food. There was a windmill. Uh, so it, it was a complete village. And then when the war came, then every, all, the, all the villages from surrounding area, they moved in here for they protection. They mo moved in here for protection and to fight against the enemies. You see the water here, but around there there's water and around there there's another line of water. So they have to go three times over the water to enter the fortress. Okay. So what, was that the same armament of cannons out there? Or were they smaller? Because they were smaller. They were smaller. Yes. So they could pull in here and these could shoot over them. These could shoot over them because these can shoot about between 500 and 1500 meters. So they can shoot over and reach the German border if necessary. But you're never sure where the bullet ends. <laughs> no, it's, it's not a rifle, it's a cannonball. They kind of go where they, where no. they sort of want to go. In about 1800, uh, in the French period, the French people were living here and they built an, an, an well, extra line of defense just on the German border. And if you walk around the fortress, you will find parts of the old uh, fortress just outside on the German border. So for the original armament of a fort or a ship to have switched locations and places and done battle somewhere else sometimes have come back and sometimes have been replaced with something new or as the forts were upgraded it's not unusual i don't know if there's a date on this puppy here uh it does look like it does look like it actually took some battle damage this is amazing if this is actual battle damage this is just like we see in the steel of the domes of the Maginot Line or the East Wall, you see battlements, you see scars. And of course, 
you would try to take out the enemy's artillery. So you'd be firing whatever you had at their big cannons so they couldn't fire at you. If that is battle damage, that is amazing. And this certainly does look like it has a bit more age to it. This. They do look like they're a pair. Similar armament. This has deep scars too. Look at this. Look at this. This actually didn't quite penetrate, but this really took some damage. Probably why they were decommissioned. These two cannons comes with a story. I don't yet know what that story is, but they came with a story, and they were from 1793. 793. I cannot wait to hear what the story is with these, because they took damage, and they took damage during battle. We see two cannons here uh, at the fortress, and they are uh, both from about 1800. Uh, and they are built in the French period and it was uh, Napoleon who came to the Netherlands and took these cannons uh, with him and when he went back to France or after this period the, the cannons stayed here at Boutanga. So I mean when he went back to France involuntarily, when he got kicked back to France or when he after Russia? And when he was just kicked back to France and then, then well he didn't take with him all his cannons so they, they stayed here and after we started rebuilding the fortress we found cannons and we placed them back here. These are Napoleon's guns. I wonder what story they could tell. Every weekend on Saturday or Sunday we shoot with these cannons. Only not with the real bullets, because if we shoot the bullets they will end somewhere in Germany. And that's not, not good. If you look at the star from above you can see all straight lines between the, 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 the stars. So with only a few people you can watch entirely around the fortress. So that's uh, quite easy. Also the, the marketplace, the middle of it, from the middle of the marketplace you can see all counters all points of the fortress. So with only six people you can do communication. And if you stand above here you can look out over uh, the, the environment and you can see the enemy from far away coming up. Because it's the fortress and then it's a huge uh, area around it with uh, no vegetation. Now there is a lot of vegetation but in the uh, 17th century there was almost no vegetation around. There is a difference between the, the eastern stars and the western stars, because uh, from Germany there came a Bernard van Galen, he was the bishop for, from uh, Münster, he came in and wants to take in the fortress, so there was more danger from the German side, so there are more cannons on the German side. But what a gorgeous place. See the original building, see the arches are by the windows, obviously they've been re reconditioned they've been repurposed cleaned up so there can be lived in but they're still the same buildings and here inside this star one cannon over there in observation post is the mill now when this mill was built I'm very curious to learn it would be somewhat exposed How the corners line up. You walk right down here in a straight line you get to the city center. Now the windmill that's here it actually stood in this place and it's been standing here since the 17th century. This one is a replica because the old one well didn't make it. For the windmill it's, it's standing here and it was used uh, for, for uh, production of meal and so they could uh, bake bread in the, in the fortress here. But if you come from abroad and you see the windmill, you put, take your canoe and you shoot on the windmill. 
So if there was an enemy coming up, they broke down the entire windmill. But then they had a problem, there's no food in the fortress. So if the windmill was broke down, there was not a windmill, or not a windmill, a mill inside this building, powered by horses. This is the other mill where the horses were. This, this is the other mill, the, the horse-powered uh, mill. Uh, we can go in and you can see how it works. Do we need horses? Yeah, we need horses, but maybe I can try it. No, I think you should let me do it. But okay. it's, it's, you will not, it's, it's stuck now. But normally okay. they put on a horse like here and then it's all going down and it makes a lot of noise. But I think it's years ago uh, that there was a horse uh, using this mill. And this is where you grind the actual flour? Finally, the flour comes out here. It goes from this one to this one, and then this one is getting turned, and the small one turns, and these are the two big stones, and then the flour comes out here. Of course, mill wheels. It, it, it's a mill, only it's inside. Yeah, and but all this, all this mechanism is just to turn those two stones. So, yes, that's... And that's where you get the term millstones from. That's, that's the millstone, yes. You probably have a couple of old millstones laying around out here there's, somewhere. There's one just at the entrance of the building. That is no that millstone. That's no millstone. That it is. It's a completely old millstone because you can see it, it's a hole inside and it's used like a yeah. millstone. And you can see it's, it's a lot of damage on it, so it's been used a long time. And there, of course, is the church within the walls safely. I know there's a placard in stone on the other side of the yes. church that of course I can't read because it's only in Dutch. And when was the original church built? There must have been a church on this place before. About 1600 it was uh, built. And then this, this is rebuilt about 1800. So did they tear it down and build a new church? They built a new bigger church. That's what I thought. Yes. Look at the cut on this building. This is not a 90 degree angle. It's like just so it's cut to fit with a walkway. With so many amazing fortresses and forts laying in complete ruin around the world, it was amazing when in the 70s this had been completely overgrown, neglected, the waterways had been filled in, when the Dutch government officials decided to restore this. And they're still restoring constantly, and it is a pleasure to see. There's nothing I love more than to see history being protected and restored. And I think it's amazing that they rallied together to rescue this star fort, to rescue the village. And people still live here, moved in here, have their shops and livelihoods and all the puppy dogs, because this is just a beautiful place. It is one of the most beautiful fortified places I have ever seen. And you can honestly say, they don't build them like this anymore. Now, get into the battlements. I am imagining that these are the magazines or the powder magazines. And up here was a cannon position. And here you would have, imagine one of the battlements. And you can really see the entire landscape from here. You just see how neat and sharp the corners are of the star that makes up this village. Although honestly, battlements are battlements. I think this is the bathroom. It does have all the charms and hallmarks of an outhouse. If I look back there, I'm seeing a, I'm seeing a cannon position. I'm seeing a fighting position. I'm seeing a moat. But when I turn around and I'm looking at this, I'm seeing a toilet.
I literally am seeing an outhouse. But I guess pooping in the direction of the enemy, well, that's defense too, isn't it? That's a beautiful historic place where you can actually live in here. There must be a raffle. I would imagine there'd be a lot of people that really want to live here. It's a couple hours drive from Amsterdam, a couple hours drive from Bremen. It well, might be considered a little remote, but it's peaceful and it's beautiful and it's historic. And it's quiet. I appreciate the quiet part, I truly do. So, when I'm up here now, but no, it's not a powder magazine. It's, sort of um, it's in use. If there was danger, and you you could not go out uh, over the bridges, you could out could go, could go out of the fortress through this whole, this place. Just go out here. There was a boat lying, and you could fly away from the fortress. But you you would think that if there was danger in the fortress, it would be surrounded. Yes, maybe. But people could leave the for, leave the fortress through this, and also if it was a fire or they need water, they could go through this and get some water out. Of See, what we also have here is a sortie port. You see, the battle would not just take place on the bastions. It will also take place sometimes underground. Tunneling was a widely used part of siege warfare. However, on these two forts, both surrounded and inundated by water, it would be less likely to happen here. However, sorties were most certainly used, where in the dead of night, a group of soldiers would leave the fortress and harry the enemy camp, or outright assault or attack them. And depending on the situation, reinforcements could also enter through here. Dignitaries could flee, or supplies could be delivered in the middle of the night, especially messages to and from the outside allies that you hope that will one day come rescue you if you need your siege alleviated. Uh, 17th century, the powder magazines were in the fortress, and we have one small and we have one big powder fortress. I, I, oh, double doors! Double doors! Double doors from the. Double doors, huge walls, one meter. So it's now it's a uh, movie theater. We show a movie about uh, the fortress here normally, and this was the former powder house. I wonder if they put a well in front of the powder magazine. This is the new powder magazine, which would hold 45,000 pounds of powder. And the walls are a meter thick, and of course it was nicely restored. It should be safe. Isn't it? <laughs> now it's safe. And then you have the well right next to the powder magazine. Yes, is that, is that by accident? or? I think it's by accident, yes. Because if it's really burning, there's no, no water in this. <laughs> no, and you're not going to get to it no, in, no. in time. Never. And the roof was built with a weakness, so that if the powder should explode, the walls would hold, but it would go vertical into the air and not destroy the surrounding buildings. That is pretty advanced for 500 years ago. The, the offices, the, the most important people live uh, the, close to the center of the city, and the, the soldiers, the poor soldiers, they live at the outside of the fortress. So this was a soldier house. So, were all the soldiers volunteers, or were the conscription? Most, mostly volunteers. There were mm -hmm. only a few uh, were living here all, all, all time. Mostly the volunteers or people just were, were told, come to the fortress, you have to fight. But Holland has a, has a pretty rich military tradition, a yes. naval tradition. Yes, but here, here it's, it's a poor re region, and no, normally there were only 50, 60 persons living here in the fortress. So, if there was any danger, they came out and, and there came a lot of soldiers from other places. So, they were all volunteers. This is, this is an interesting representation of the room back in the day, because the room was where you lived, where, where you cooked, where you had the heat. Yes. Where, and where the beds. Where they slept, the beds. And they're very small, the beds. Well, people were smaller back then. Yes, but they, they were they, they, they didn't lay down where they were asleep, they were just sitting. Because yeah. they thought if the, the blood came to the head, they will be killed. So Really? Yes, that, that's what they thought in that period. And also, if there are soldiers and you are sitting, and you have to wake up, then you can just run out of your bed and go out for a fight. We had some very strange beliefs back in the day, didn't yes. we? At least the kings and queens, they, they laid down in their... They had huge beds, but... 
Normally the soldiers, the officers uh, here, they didn't uh, lay down to sleep, they were sitting. So the 17th century? Yes, 17th century. So they would actually have, uh, they have water? They had water. Here? Here. here. They had actually had a well. With a, so yes, was there a pump? Well. Was there a pump or was there pressure? No, it was a pump. They had to do it by hand. Because here, here is the... And that's the pump? It's the pump, yes. But it doesn't work anymore, but... That... That should be wonderful. If it was Stove, heat, everything. Yes, and it's, it's for heating and it's for cooking. They look like uh, powder kegs, but I'm guessing they're not. I don't think so. I think it's for uh, meat or fish uh, to, to be kept in. From the peak, they, they were uh, pointing like this, so you should protect your, your breast as uh, most important. Uh, because with, with shooting, they were not shooting so good uh, like uh, today. If, if you shoot a bullet, it should end somewhere uh, in that period. So mostly you should be protected because you were fighting man to man. That's the best protection you need. So this one is to get some distance uh, with your uh, enemy. Well, here you have a sword and well, you know what to do with a sword. This one was not uh, armed with uh, any musket or something like that. The ruffles on the shoulder, or is that just a, a design? It's, it's just design and the clothing from that period. And the shape of the hat, I've seen the, the Spaniards, that was a similar design? It's a similar design, yes. Actually, I'm always impressed with how advanced boots and shoes were yes. back in the day. And you see the little, see the ramp that's built up for the cannon to pull it up and down. He's a limb here saying that there's also a blacksmith here in this town that would make cannonballs. This is just phenomenal. And here you see how the cannons are stacked. So you can literally battle in all directions of the star. Remember, I'm on the I'm on one of the points. At every point, there's for observation. Might be a little exposed if the enemy shows up with the same, but still, it'll get the job done. And I guess they were shorter back then, so they might have had to have a box to stand on. But from here, you can survey the complete landscape surrounding this point and all the other points would have similar and you could transmit straight down in to the center of the village just look at how it lined up When you're here in this star on the observation tower and you look down the lines, you can see how the water separates the small islands and you can see the next observation tower. So signaling completely possible. You have a cannon right here. Certainly with smaller weapons you could protect each other and lend mutual support if one side was about to be overrun, it could be protected by the others. Another outhouse, so on either side, there's a um, way to relieve yourselves. I mean, that is doing a little extra damage to the enemy that is expected to swim through the waters, now full of, well, crap. I think the little hearts in the doors of the outhouse, it's a very, very nice touch. For an enemy coming out here on these wide open plains, if you start firing grape shots in their direction, just decimate them. And another thing, the benefit of having your cannons, your artillery, this high up, is that you can shoot down, depending on your load, 
far and lower upon your enemy but your enemy would be sitting down here out here on the marshlands so they would have to not only drag up their artillery under fire but then they would also have to elevate it in a way under fire to hit your artillery up here on the banks now I know Napoleon he always said God favors those with the best artillery and nothing is thus impossible however it's a bit of a challenge it's very easy to sum up the history of the world into one of conquest and wars and defense and attack because well we're human beings that's what we do we go to war and wars bring up the very worst and the very best of human beings and also brings out at sometimes an explicit beauty because much as we think of defensive positions and bunkers and cannons and tanks and planes they are not necessarily what you'd say pretty or beautiful this is one of the most beautiful places I have ever seen it is symmetrical it is beautiful it is well designed this is a very 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 special place I hope you enjoy history and military history as much as I love bringing it to you. And if you want to see more of the photos and documents I've used for these episodes, documentation and so on, you can go to lostbattlefields.com. And if you feel like helping me out traveling around the world to some of these far-flung locations like Van Allen Brown's first test stand behind me or Deepness nuclear reactor down there or the Magula line over there, you can donate on PayPal. Uh, protection at serviceint.com it'll be right here and it is also on lostbattlefields.com you absolutely don't have to but i appreciate any help and i love all you guys for all the support you've shown me because history is important we all know that and i'm gonna bring it to you